Hello everyone, it is still week two of the paleo diet. Hi everyone, I'm Robina. And I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Nutrition Unpacked. It is officially almost the end of week two of being paleo. How do you feel? I think week two was definitely better than week one i'm sitting here editing our video uh for next week which includes a lot of the footage that Layla and i took during our first week of paleo and i'm just laughing we were so miserable i can't believe like that week was brutal and i remember it. i mean it was literally last week so i remember it but it's just so funny like watching the footage back I don't know. I think we were quite, I was quite miserable the first I was week. quite, quite miserable. Um, I've picked a term, the paleo depression, and I've definitely been, been feeling the paleo depression. It's, it's gotten a little better this week. I think for me, it's more like the paleo PMS. Egg and fruit snack game still going strong. One thing that I'm noticing this week, I think I've like mentally stabilized a little bit. I don't know if it's like psychologically, I've just come to be at peace with kind of the foods that I can eat now and can't eat now, or if me just kind of increasing my portion sizes and my protein is kind of just helping with my mood and energy levels and hunger levels. But I'm definitely overall feeling a lot better this week. I mean, not better than pre-paleo, but definitely better than last week. I feel kind of almost back to normal now. But like, I don't know, it was like, been moody yeah i've been not so much hungry this week but i have still been missing like certain certain things i got some inspiration from Rubina this week i am having stuffed red peppers with like ground beef and ground pork on the inside which honestly are pretty good except for the lack of salt okay boys and girls about two hours since i ate these peppers were they good they were okay missing salt but actually pretty good for like a little paleo meal no salt but i think the second week the big shift that I noticed even like the day one, day two of week two was that I think I just, I wasn't as much like mourning my losses. I've been kind of sitting here reflecting on how the first week went and kind of how I want to handle things moving forward. The thing that's standing out to me is that I think first week I was really mourning my losses. I think I was very heavily focused on the foods that I wasn't able to eat anymore. And what that translated into was looking at the dishes that I typically enjoy and then just trying to find paleo swaps. Like for example, okay, so I can't have my typical avocado egg toast, but you know, getting those almond flour tortillas and then putting avocado and eggs in there to kind of replicate the same type of dish. I think, you know, for the first week transitioning into paleo, that was an okay way to go. The next step for me now is just trying new recipes that are inherently paleo rather than kind of focusing on what I can't have and mourning my losses in that way. Honestly, like my main focus this week was somewhat similar is like, how do I just not feel so hungry? And how do I make sure I don't lose copious amounts of weight on this diet? It is now eight o'clock. I've been up since 6.30 and I've been cooking and trying to get food ready for the day. So I'm not starving. Could I have been better and planned this yesterday? Absolutely. I already have my first breakfast, which is egg and avocado. And I have my second breakfast right here. This is a uh, smoothie I made with apple, mango, coconut milk, ginger, cinnamon, and I think that's everything. So I'm really excited to eat this. Oh, and pecans are in here as well. And then I have my lunch in here, which I'll show you guys a little bit more later, and lots of healthy snacks. So hopefully this will keep me going throughout the day so I don't become miserable. So I was just thinking, okay, what can I eat that is high calorie enough? And like, how can I structure my meals so that I get enough in the day? And I actually feel like I was pretty successful in that because I haven't been too hungry this week. Yes, I noticed that as well. I, I think I, I my portion sizes of all my meals have definitely gone up and that made a really huge difference. I think what my problem the first week, which was, I mean, it's kind of silly now that I think about it, but I think just out of habit, I was like plating up the same amount of chicken or plating up the same amount of vegetables. And then I was like, but missing some of the other starchy components and that was obviously not smart but i figured it out you kind of have to rethink about how you think of meals yeah. when you're taking on such a restrictive diet like you i don't know i spent a lot of time at the beginning of this week being like okay what the heck am i gonna eat because as you mentioned like normally if i have toast for breakfast or oatmeal for breakfast that's completely scrapped and out the window i have to figure out some kind of substitute for that. It is Sunday night. Sunday is kind of like the day where I try and get my shit together. 
figure out what I'm going to eat for the week. And so I'm trying to take my learnings from last week, which is that I was so freaking hungry all the time and figure out a way to not be hungry all the time. So I'm going to try and like brainstorm some meals, do some more better meal planning, have some more things to eat throughout the day and hopefully combat my hunger so that I'm not a raging B word this week. Uh, is there anything that you've been missing this week? What, you know, I know you said that you weren't so much focused on what you couldn't have, mm. but is there anything that you were kind of like, hmm, that would have been nice. Oh, cheese. You know what I've been thinking a lot about today? Cheese. I really want cheese, but I can't have cheese. I don't know how to reconcile that. Yes, you texted me about that. You're like, I'm dreaming of cheese. There was one day, I don't know if it was uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, I could not stop thinking about cheese from like the first thing, like I woke up and I was like, I could really use some cheese right now. Cheese is something like I go to when I'm like kind of hungry, but like, exactly. I don't, you just like, you know, cut off a little bit of cheese and then it's satisfying, it's, satisfying. Right? it's salty, it's good, it's creamy, it's delicious. I, I mean, think it was that salty taste that I was looking for, that very specific, I think God, I like, am like <laughs> salt. I don't know what's wrong with me, but like I feel like I'm really missing salt. Like, <laughs> it smells. Like, it smells like chemicals. It doesn't smell like food. <laughs> That's so gross. That's so weird though, because it's technically probably less like added chemicals and stuff. Like, isn't this supposed to be like egg and like what is in this? Cassava flour, cage free egg whites, tapioca starch. Are you already eating it? Yeah, it actually slaps. I like this. This is good. I would eat this even if I wasn't paleo. Mmm. <laughs> not that much flavor though, eh? No, but I, I like it. It's spicy. This is spicy salsa. I don't think I'd pay seven dollars a bag for this. <laughs> this is what you've been eating. Yeah. It's it's honestly been the hardest thing. Is just like everything with no salt and like these meals I'm making. Just I'm like this salt is missing. Last night I meal prepped a veggie packed meatloaf. Uh, it was a recipe from the paleodiet.com website. I mean, it doesn't look the most appetizing, uh, but I actually haven't properly tried it yet. So let me give it a go for you guys. I see the potential. I see the potential. I feel like all potential gets lost when you don't have salt. I don't know, it's just like, I just see other people cooking with salt, people eating things with salt in it, and I'm like, I just want some salt. I made a curry with shrimp in it, and like shrimp are a little salty, and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> On top of salt, like there are a few different things that I've been missing throughout this week, and as we go through the paleo diet, I'm like, where's my lentils? Like, I just really want some lentils. I'm a huge lentils girl. Huge beans, girl. I feel like a horrible Indian person that that has not crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. All the beans, all the lentils, completely off limits because of those damn anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients is a very big word on Dr. Cordain's website. It's everywhere. It's like anti-nutrients this, anti-nutrients that you can't eat this, anti-nutrients. And like, I feel like people don't know what that is. And also, I don't even know if Dr. Cordain fully knows what anti-nutrients are. It's no. a big topic, but I think the term definitely it's like there's a very negative connotation mm -hmm. to the term so i think it's yeah as soon as you say oh some food has a lot of anti-nutrients i can see how it could be like oh wow so i shouldn't eat that on his website he says you know unlike animals that have sharp teeth or elusive speed to defend themselves plants don't roar and can't run away facts <laughs> they defend themselves from foraging animals via anti-nutrients natural plant compounds intended to make them highly unpalatable or extremely uncomfortable for animals to consume. They can be mildly to highly problematic in humans. His perspective is that, you know, plants are using these anti-nutrients as a way to prevent other organisms from consuming them. So as he said, you know, because plants can't run away or scare them off in a different way, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna hurt your health and therefore you'll stop eating me. Which is interesting. Um, and I think first we should really talk like anti-nutrients are basically anything that can inhibit the absorption or utilization of nutrients in your body. It could do that by either binding to other nutrients or by preventing other enzymes from breaking down food 
because our, in our digestive system, your body has to first break down the food so that it can absorb it. This idea of antinutrients comes up in the paleo diet is because a lot of plant foods like legumes and grains and even tubers do contain antinutrients. So this knowledge is what's kind of driving those principles where these types of foods are essentially off limits. That being said, I think even though there are definitely nuggets of truth in there, I think there are, in my view, some flaws in kind of his argument and ultimately the conclusion that he ends up reaching. Let's go through them one at a time. I think the first main thing to consider is that even though a lot of these compounds, they do exist in these plant foods, the claims that he's making about the harms of these compounds, most of that research is done in either cell cultures or small animal studies. Basically in these studies, they will isolate the specific compound that is found in a certain plant and then give it in high doses to like a rat or take a cell and like dunk it in this compound and be like, look, the cell died or like, oh, look, the rat got sick. But again, like we don't just eat antinutrients, you know, these foods that Dr. Uh, Cordain is warning about aren't just antinutrients. And a, a lot of times these studies use quantities of antinutrients that are way, way, way far above anything that you could possibly ever eat. Making that kind of conclusion about oh, we should avoid all foods with anti-nutrients and therefore I'm making a new way of eating specifically around this whole concept of avoiding anti-nutrients. It's a little bit premature. And when we talk about scientific evidence, which we've gone into many, many times before, you know, there's lots of value to cell studies and there's lots of value to animal studies, but we can't make our conclusions based off of those things. We have to test our hypotheses. Absolutely. I think a lot of those studies, they're so valuable because they give us some insight into possible mechanisms that could definitely prompt another research question or another hypothesis. But ultimately, that hypothesis also needs to be tested. There are a bunch of different anti-nutrients that he likes to talk about, including saponins, lectins, tannins, protease inhibitors. But let's pick an example to talk about. Uh, let's talk about lectins. Lectins is a really hot topic and you know, he's not the only one that's on the anti-lectin train. Um, we did a whole video on Dr. Gundry and his perspectives on lectins and their effects on health. But essentially lectins are proteins that bind to carbohydrates. They're found in a lot of legumes and whole grains. Lectins end up passing through our digestive tract undigested. And it's thought that the proteins essentially activate the immune response in your bodies and your body will start attacking it because it thinks that it's a foreign harmful invader. Dr. Cornane also thinks that lectins increase our intestinal permeability, meaning that it supposedly like pokes holes in our intestines and allows food to kind of leak into other parts of our bodies where we don't want it to. When you have excessive levels of that permeability, that's where the term leaky gut comes from. And this is an interesting area because there's some, I think, contention even within the medical or scientific space about whether this is a valid condition or valid phenomenon. The research that Dr. Cordain is pointing to is very interesting. And so they'll take, in this case, Syrian golden hamsters, and they'll feed them raw bean powders. So we do know that there are compounds in beans that can be harmful if you don't cook your beans. But anyway, they take these raw beans, they grind them up, they give them to the hamsters and they're like, look, the hamsters got sick. Look at the hamsters intestines, horrible. And so he's using that as a way to say, okay, we shouldn't be eating beans. When really we have to look a little deeper into it. No one is eating raw beans. No one is eating raw bean powder and no one is eating lectins in such a high concentration. And in fact, when we look at studies of human beings who have been given beans, we don't see anything of the sort. In fact, beans are a very healthful food. We, they're associated with decreases in cholesterol, improved gut health. So we gotta look at the food as a whole and also like test our hypotheses in what they call an ecologically relevant way. What that means is like the preparation method also is very relevant, right? Like just like eating raw chicken or undercooked chicken even would also be harmful. Can we really use that as an argument to say that therefore chickens are harmful to us and therefore we shouldn't eat them? I don't know. This man's <laughs> just making some 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 leaps. He's, and he, the thing is, is also some of these anti nutrients that he's like looking up. He's like only citing these studies in cells and animals, but there is research out there for human beings, and it's so weird to me. And also, like when we're talking about these things being anti nutrients, really the risk that we're talking about there is that potentially it could inhibit your absorption of nutrients. Not necessarily that it's going to cause like 
toxicity toxicity and and all these different issues that he then claims like these foods have anti-nutrients therefore they're bad for you because they're going to cause all of these other problems no the issue with anti-nutrients is just the fact that they could inhibit your ability to absorb certain nutrients but for most of us that's not really a huge issue because we are getting a lot of food from a lot of different sources so you're saying that it would be more of a concern if under eating was already a situation that you're dealing with on on top of that you're eating foods that might be inhibiting the absorption of nutrients but when we're talking about anti-nutrients this is something that some dietitians and medical professionals should be aware of but that's mostly in places where there is limited food access or high levels of food insecurity and that's because you know the sources of food tend to be mostly the same you're not really getting too much dietary variety and also there may be limitations on Nutri these nutrients um, of concern. So that's kind of like the biggest risk factor with, with anti-nutrients, but Dr. Cordain really then like blows it up. Another potential kind of limitation to his perspective is that, and this might be kind of counterintuitive, but some of these anti-nutrients have actually shown to be beneficial to our health. For example, saponins. Saponins comes up a lot and we have been deprived of potatoes the last two weeks because of these Dang saponins. <laughs> saponins are in potatoes, legumes, and grains, and apparently even in what they call pseudo grains, so things like chia seeds and quinoa. The thing with saponins is like this is a whole class of molecules. And so there are some that are actively harmful. And so if you've ever seen like the like don't eat a green potato, or I know there's an episode of Arthur. Arthur, no! I think it was like Buster ate the green potato chip or and then it became this big deal and like i think there's a whole thing about like not eating green potatoes and the issue is this green potatoes can actually make you sick yes and it is because of the, the saponins. saponins so yeah don't eat a green potato absolutely so there are actually different types of saponins and the green depicts alpha alpha chaconin yes and alpha chaconin and alpha solanine yeah, these are words we've never learned Lived before. before. <laughs> um, but yeah, so alpha chaconine is a steroidal glycoalkaloid, if you were curious. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it is a natural toxin that can be produced in potatoes and what we would visually see on the outside is that it has that green color, which is why it is like a public safety food safety recommendation <laughs> to not eat potatoes if they're green yeah apparently the, the potatoes make that when they get stressed out they get like stressed and like oh my gosh we need to <laughs> make toxins to make toxins <laughs> yeah and i think it's to protect themselves from like insects and stuff like that or like viruses or bacteria that's what that's what stresses out potatoes there are a lot of other saponins that are out there and you know research on saponins have actually shown that several of them are actually beneficial for health there's lots of studies on the benefit and actually when you look up like saponins effects on human health on like google scholar what actually comes up is a lot of articles promoting the health benefits of saponins these include the fact that they are potentially um, an agent for helping with lowering blood lipids so like a lot of people have high cholesterol levels saponins have been found to potentially be able to lower those levels also potentially can be uh, anti-carcinogenic which means that they can help prevent cancer and one of the things that he criticized about saponins in a lot of these foods is that again that it increases intestinal permeability and compromises our digestive health but ironically research in humans actually seems to suggest the opposite in that it can actually help our intestinal health by reducing inflammation and funnily enough uh, some of the foods that dr cordain fully allows on the diet that are not banned are actually high in saponins and those include things like cassava asparagus that's a good segue into kind of another maybe hole in his perspective where there seems to be maybe some inconsistencies in terms of which anti-nutrients that he kind of picks on so for example oxalates are another well-known anti-nutrient this is an anti-nutrient that's found in a lot of leafy green vegetables they can bind to calcium and make it harder to absorb calcium as well but of course leafy greens are very well encouraged on this diet there is also another class of anti-nutrients called goitrogens those are found in brassica vegetables like broccoli and brussels sprouts and all of that as well as millet and cassava and you know i don't know about millet but i think that cassava and brassica vegetables are all encouraged on the paleo diet i think the final maybe the biggest 
maybe a leap that's been taking or like the hole in this argument is kind of maybe missing the whole food perspective. So there's a lot of focus on individual compounds and looking at it in isolation in large amounts, like what it, that might do to a cell in a glass or in a small rodent. But we also need to think about what in real life, when we, people are eating whole foods, are we seeing those same negative health outcomes? And luckily we do have research in this, research looking at the effects on things like legumes and whole grains on health in humans. And the thing is, is like time and 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 time again, almost unanimously, we see major health benefits from eating things like legumes and whole grains. Legumes can help, uh, you know, first of all, keep you regular, which, that's something else to talk about. I Let's talk about that. <laughs> something that I've been debating, talking about, I don't know if it's something that anyone would even care about or want to hear about, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk about this because I think this is a very valid and important thing to talk about when we're talking about dietary changes in general. Yeah, essentially, okay, I'm talking about poop. Let's talk about poop. I have definitely noticed a drastic downturn in the quality of my bowel movements since switching to this paleo diet. I've speculated for a while that I might have IBS and I've definitely noticed some connections with certain like certain fruits and vegetables that don't leave things very happy. I mean to be fair like my intake of certain vegetables that are considered like high FODMAP uh, have been quite high over the last uh like over the last week and a half ish that i've been doing this paleo diet i don't know i love broccoli so much because i feel like a lot of the criticisms of these anti-nutrients is talking about its effect on our digestive health you know talking about intestinal permeability and possible impacts on like gas and bloating and less than wonderful quality bowel movements i can tell you that things for me have gone downhill the last Actually, two weeks. Things have gone downhill as well for me. I'm like really bloated and like kind of gross. Yes. Like I honestly like really don't really often get bloated unless I eat lactose and I'm bloated like all the time. Honestly, I've never had this issue before, but these peppers, they have me rooting and tooting. But my belly, she's she's screaming. She's screaming. So honestly, Dr. Cordain might've been right on this one. Maybe I am like nightshade intolerant. Maybe, maybe the anti-nutrients are getting to me. They're getting in my belly. They're, they're riling things up down there because I don't know. My question is, if you can't eat like anything and then you also can't eat nightshades, what the heck are you supposed to eat on this diet? And it's like, it's not like, like, it's like I have, <laughs> there's a little TMI, but I'm like a fart, super farty. But after the fartiness wears off, I'm still bloated and I don't know what it is. I don't normally feel like this. So I don't know what I'm eating because I'm not eating anything new, but I am eating things in like greater quantity so i don't know yeah i know like with these types of things i mean it's not and this is uh, maybe another hole in his argument that we can talk about where it's, it's quantity matters mm -hmm. i mean i know <laughs> quality over quantity but i mean this is a situation where i think quantity matters like when we're talking about the dose makes the poison i think there can be certain foods where if you were able to have a more varied diet than you are now then maybe certain compounds you would end up just eating less of, but now you're having to kind of fill those other gaps by eating more of certain foods. What I'm saying is that I'm having to eat a lot more vegetables mm -hmm. than I was before. And I don't know, I'm noticing, and maybe it is because of just the greater amounts of those specific types of fiber that are kind of making, because fiber is a very, uh, she's just a tricky little bitch, but you don't wanna go too low, low on your fiber. You don't wanna go too high on your fiber. You kind of have to be mindful of your hydration and everything, and even the types, there are different types of fiber and the amounts of the different types of fiber. And for me, what I've been experiencing is definitely looser consistency, but also just like incomplete bowel movements to the point where, it's definitely been affecting my mood. I will say like, I know that your gut is very sensitive. I haven't been having those uh, issues. I will say I'm having monster poops. These poops are <laughs> huge. <laughs> They're huge. Do you feel like it's done better? No, or, like more. my complete? digestion is worse, but and like not even more complete. Like I think I'm still getting rid of like percentage wise, the same amount of poop. Actually, sometimes I feel like these are like less complete poops. Like I feel like I haven't gotten rid of everything, even though they're huge. That might be just maybe like that might not be the paleo diet as a whole. Maybe it's the way I'm doing it, but 
I'm not having a good time. That, I mean, that's what my speculation is. I'm not going to blame it on the paleo diet per se, mm -hmm. but I, like, really love broccoli. Like, I love all of those vegetables that mm -hmm. are... It's not uncommon to have maybe digestive issues with certain vegetables, and I have been happy because I just, I love broccoli. I love broccoli, too. Yeah. But I don't have those problems when I have legumes and whole grains, so... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe oh. we should start our own diet. Oh. We're like, oh, this is actually how our ancestors ate. But you know, like when we're <laughs> when we're talking about like like and stuff like that, we see they have cholesterol lowering effects. We see positive um, associations with cardiovascular disease risk, with cancer risk, with like everything diabetes, diabetes risk, with helping with managed blood sugars. We see all these positive things, and we can't say, oh, it's because of this specific anti nutrient without studying that specific anti nutrient, but. Even if that anti-nutrient is bad, we can see from studying the whole food that the benefits of that food outweighs the potential negatives of the anti-nutrient, which a lot of these anti-nutrients, we can't even say with any definitive scientific proof that they are detrimental. Obviously, they can inhibit the absorption of certain nutrients, which depending on like where you live and what kind of food you have access to can be a detriment on health. But like if you're getting enough, there's not enough scientific evidence to show they are impeding health. Mm -hmm. And so cutting out things that we know are beneficial to health because they might contain a small amount of something that maybe might be detrimental to your health, but definitely pales in comparison to the benefit it gives to your health. This doesn't make that much sense. If we're doing equations, it's like, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah, here, I found it enough. He's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. He's like, there okay, you go. There oh, you're is, looking for an idiom. Okay. <laughs> I found one. I found one. So throw the baby out with the bathwater. And also he's just ignoring some other foods that like also have anti-nutrients in them. So let's, uh, let's talk about week three. Oh, How are you feeling? Okay, I actually feel optimistic that we're halfway through. I really do feel optimistic that we're halfway through. I think, you know, last week I did really well in terms of staying to my paleo. This week I think I did even better staying to my paleo. I am going out for dinner tonight. Actually, yeah, this is actually day six of week two. So we mm -hmm. still have the rest of today and rest of tomorrow to get through to finish week two. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm going to have a very... I don't even know if I feel right calling it Paleo Flex, but paleo let's flex. say Paleo Flex meal coming tomorrow. Okay. So it's day seven of week two of Paleo, and I'm about to head out to a little girly spa day with a couple of friends. I think we'll check out the hot tub, we're getting massages, and then we're going to uh, have lunch at the spa as well. And I've looked at the menu in advance, and I mean, for each course, there's only a handful of options, maybe four or five options. I'm going to do my best to kind of, I guess, just focus on the main components rather than maybe other things that are added during the preparation. So what I mean by that is like if things are cooked in butter or and for sure there's going to be salt, I don't think I'm going to be able to have any control over that. We'll see. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Okay, so I just finished my spa day, had a wonderful, wonderful massage, did end up getting one of the salads. Uh, so it was mostly just arugula and some sunflower seeds and I think hemp hearts. Um, and then I got the roasted chicken with Brussels sprouts and mushrooms. I did ask for them to not include the rice uh, and they gladly obliged uh, and it was delicious. Tonight I'm going out for dinner. I'm hoping it's going to be more paleo flex than paleo flex you know i'm hoping that i can really stick to it okay so i just got back from dinner out and it's the first meal out i've had since i've been on the paleo diet and honestly it wasn't as bad as i thought the food selection was good it was a like steak a brazilian steakhouse so there was lots of options i will say i did cheat a little bit i had some salt um but not as bad as i thought it was kind of sad to see everyone eating their dessert and eating you know fries and other potatoes and bread and stuff like that but overall not bad i think that just goes to show a little bit about the feasibility of this and because like food is like something that brings everyone together and stuff like that it's hard to be social and be paleo without being yeah. just like that person who's like actually i'm paleo i was like when i got this dinner invitation i was like oh my god i don't know where they're picking yet but i'm gonna be so embarrassed yeah. i have to be like actually i'm paleo i can't eat that can you imagine if you if they pick like this top-notch italian place i know i was like please not italian please not italian please not and then i heard it was yeah. it was brazilian i was like yes like halfway through do i think i can keep this long term no is it the hardest diet in the entire world no, I think with the if you're doing true paleo, that's like brutal. But I feel like a paleo flex, like paleo flex, is pretty feasible. Pretty feasible for I feel like for most people. Yeah, like our main takeaway here is I think the paleo diet 
it's coming at it from the angle of health and kind of focusing on health promoting foods. And while it does promote a lot of foods that are health promoting, it may also be getting you to limit or restrict foods that are also health promoting. Mm -hmm. So if you are pursuing the paleo diet because health is important to you, then it might be worth considering that maybe actually being a little bit more flexible in the rules and what foods you choose to include may actually be more beneficial than harmful. On that note, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a video and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks for watching.